In 2003, I became a full-time caregiver for my father. As early as 1999, he began having some troubling experiences that culminated in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's and cancer. My mother, his wife of almost 50 years, was simply overwhelmed. They had planned well for retirement, but not for long-term care. A long-term care provider in the home would have cost what amounted to a year's salary for me. So I kicked in. I moved home. I came from Washington, D.C. to a rural town in South Carolina to my father's homestead. Initially, I thought I would continue making art. Alzheimer's made a joke of my plans. I cared for my father along with my mother and my siblings, and day by day, I made less art. It was a beautiful time. We had some really incredible experiences. I got to know my parents as an adult friend. I learned and began document, documenting my family history. And I experienced a long and beautiful goodbye to a man who'd been my biggest fan, the champion of all my dreams. On January 22, 2007, my father slowly st slipped into the next existence. And with his final breath, I fell into a deep identity crisis. I had begun to define myself as a caregiver, having all but divorced myself from the practice of making art. And I was afraid. For the next two years, I was spinning. I took a job. And I began playing at the idea of making art. But it was a mealy mouth, voiceless kind of art. I was standing at the edge of a huge chasm between me and my artistic self. Making art in my 20s had been about pursuing fame. It was about pretty people and pretty art parties and finding a way to make a masterpiece that would make me the next Damien Hirst. Forty years of lived experience, and my perspective was changing. I was no longer concerned with pursuing fame. I was more interested in the conversations that making art had provided me. The more engaged I became in those conversations, the more alive I felt as an artist. The beauty in a child's drawing is in the deliberate and fearless nature of the marks that they make. A child is unconcerned with who sees the mark, what they think of the mark, and what value the mark will have. For a child, the moment, the experience, is everything. I wanted some of that fearlessness. And it clicked. I was in a unique position. I had been making art in the dark. I had been living in isolation. No one knew me. There were no major exhibitions attached to the work that I was creating. No one was looking to see what would come next. There were no high-stakes deals. It was just me having a conversation with an anonymous audience. I had a firm foundation. Food, shelter, all of that was taken care of. So I looked into the chasm, and I leaped. Zora Neale Hurston said, if you are silent about your pain, they will kill you and say you enjoyed it. I wanted to talk about beauty and race and age. So I stripped myself bare, intellectually, spiritually, and literally. I began to have those conversations. I became a mass crusader, hoping to tear down all notions of otherness, hoping to get a greater understanding of the things that separated us as sentient beings. 
I had held someone as they lay dying. If I failed at everything else in the world, I had already lived with great purpose. The interesting thing about being fearless is that other souls will collect and gather around you who share that same spirit. I began to try to photograph and document those places where beauty and otherness intersected. I photographed an 85-year-old who wanted the world to know that she was still beautiful, still sexually viable. I photographed a breast cancer survivor who wanted you to know that she was fearless and fine, that she was comfortable with her scars, proud of her scars. They had saved her life. People stepped out of the shadows to begin to talk about the church and marriage equality. The beautiful thing about being unafraid to fail, about being willing to expose your warts and moles and scars, is that people will take the journey with you. There's genius in that space between the dare and the action. James Baldwin said, all art is risk. As creative leaders, we risk being vulnerable to criticism, ridicule, we risk being misunderstood, yet there is no creation without risk. There is no art without giving of oneself. It was a lovely road I was traveling, but the foundation was getting shaky. I needed to pay some bills, I needed to eat, but I was looking to extend that experience of fearlessness. And I found that extension in the gift of an artist residency. The McCall Center for Visual Art and Innovation in Charlotte, North Carolina was just the place that I needed. It was three months of space, fairly healthy stipend, a community of peers, and no boundaries. And the work continued to grow. I was able to tackle tough ideas, questions about myself and my surroundings, about relationships between men and women, young and old, black and white. I followed up that residency with a month-long stay at the Vermont Studio Center, a place with a completely different personality, but with equal amounts of fearlessness and lack of boundaries. There are places in this community that offer the same boundless, fearless opportunities for artists. Here at the Harbison Theater, there's an incubator program that provides technical support and funding to artists willing to experiment and create new works for touring. 701 Center for Contemporary Art provides exhibition space and a residency program to do the same. I began to understand the symbiotic relationship between my need to be fearless and my community's need to support that fearlessness. Every time I took a different risk or stretched a little further, the landing space got broader, and the community of people there to support me and catch me got deeper. If you'd like to be a part of that community, find an artist, support their work, buy a painting, Buy a ticket to a performance. Write a check to Harbison Theater. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you too can become a part of that fearless support that artists need to create their work. Thank you.